Hi, everyone. I'm Deirdre Hogan. I'm an engineering manager at the LinkedIn Dublin office, and I'm delighted today to welcome Professor Eric Shing to, link to LinkedIn's Data Week. Eric is a professor and pre president of the Mohammed bin Said University of Artificial Intelligence. It's the world's first graduate level research based AI university. Prior to this, Eric was professor of computer science at CMU, directing the Sailing Lab, whose research spanned topics such as theoretical ML, as well as real world practical applications of ML, distributed systems, computer vision, NLP, and computational biology. Eric has co -author, has authored more than 370 research papers, which have been cited over 35,000 times. Not only this, but Eric is also an entrepreneur. He is founder, chairman, and chief scientist of Petuum, a US-based startup dedicated to democratizing the ownership and use of AI systems. They provide enterprise AI software platforms for a diverse range of application areas, such as healthcare, industrial manufacturing, uh, autonomous driving, financial services, and beyond. So I'm very excited to have Eric here today. His talk is on from learning to meta learning to Lego learning towards automating, scaling, and optimizing AI and ML operations. So thank you so much, Eric, for joining us. And I'll hand over to you now. Oh, before, sorry, one more thing. We'll have questions at the end. Um, so we'd be delighted to take questions for the last 10 minutes or so of the talk. Thank you. Over to you, Eric. Great, thank you, Deirdre. Uh, great. Uh, first of all, you know, uh, thank you for inviting me uh, to participate in this very exciting event. I realize that uh, I'm next to a few uh, very distinguished speakers, including uh, Nobel laureates and the Turing Award winners. So I'm deeply honored to give you this talk. Uh, I think uh, you know. Uh, I don't know who are in the audience. I imagine since it is a LinkedIn Data Day event, it must be you know full of. Uh, uh, not just uh, the research scientists, but also many engineers, computer programmers who are busy building your machine learning and AI solutions. And uh, I also imagine that uh, uh, in nowadays academic world, you know, we've had many presentations focusing on you know innovations in models and algorithms and theory. So on the one hand, you know, we do need best models and theory, you know, for pushing the limit. But uh, today I'm going to focus on a slightly different direction, which is uh, uh, on how to sustainably, you know, make progress, you know, in machine learning and AI deployments and production. Right. For example, you know, I think uh, one of the major challenge, you know, when I am running the company and even now running the university is to really push forward those uh, algorithms out of their lab and uh, into production. Uh, that includes, you know, any type of data, any type of model at any scale and on any infrastructure. And that has become now a severe bottleneck in machine learning and AI advancements. So I'm going to speak a little bit about uh, uh, our own experiences uh, in this direction. And my approach, again, is uh, a combination of uh, uh, both uh, principled mathematical framework and also engineering processes and uh, details in terms of their uh, implementations and the deployments, right? So let me uh, begin by acknowledging uh, contributors to this work. Here is a list of names that has been working with me, you know, in generating the materials I'm going to talk about today. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to mention all their names. They are now all over the place, you know, in university, in company uh, and elsewhere. And uh, if you have uh, detailed questions, I encourage you to read uh, their papers carefully. Right, so now back to our topic. So nowadays I think, uh, you know, AI developments, you know, are heavily driven by, you know, benchmark leaderboards and the computing horsepower, right? So uh, uh, we are all very familiar with this graph, you know, the size of uh, our state-of-the-art uh, natural language models, you know, has uh, grown dramatically over the past few years. And uh, what we call machine learning research, essentially now is becoming a arms race of uh, computing power and the money. And uh, that actually leave uh, you know, small teams, small companies, universities, you know, in a awkward situation because uh, it looks like there is no way for us to compete if we lock in ourselves into the same game. But uh, here uh, I want to present a slightly different view, which is about uh, 
and in fact, the work that you are doing every day, how to really develop real world applications in real world context. For example, you know, in healthcare industry, you know, in you know, uh, uh, e-business and uh, you know, IT industry for recommendation systems, we need to build uh, quite complex and the robust AI solutions in the form of uh, a uh, pipeline of softwares, not just an algorithm. And the first thing we are going to face is that uh, such a system need to play with and uh, digest and process a lot of a different type of data. It's not clean data. It's not only dirty, but also very heterogeneous. Taking the medical space example, you see text information from uh, clinical records. You see image information you know, from radiogram. You see time series data from uh, you know, uh, life science, and you see other type of data such as DNA and so forth, right? So how machine learning people deal with all these different type of data? Well, first of all, you know, uh, for each type of data, maybe there is already a different learning paradigms. You know, we, we use uh, you know, likelihood-based learning to deal with uh, you know, data examples, but uh, we may also need to incorporate the rules, knowledge graphs, you know, uh, sometimes we may have a interacting environment when you deal with rewards, auxiliary agents, you know, adversaries and so forth, right? And in machine learning, that leads to a very big zoo of, uh, you know, um, algorithms and the heuristics. It's a marketplace that you have many, many options. You know, every option, you know, sometimes even grow into a whole field such as reinforcement learning, transfer learning, you know, which is uh, by itself already, you know, a subfield of machine learning that develops algorithms, very specialized algorithms and the methodologies, you know, for learning a particular type of experiences. And the very often time for training such specialized models, you know, you need to also build, uh, a, you know, uh, adequate systems. So therefore there is also a system marketplace that provides you very specialized design and uh, infrastructure to uh, either carry, you know, a large scale machine learning, federated learning and so forth, right? So for a practitioner, on the one hand, you know, we are blessed by such a rich resource of uh, uh, possible uh, solutions and the alternatives. But the, on the other hand, it is a very big space to navigate and it requires substantial knowledge uh, and experiences in making the good choice. And especially when you are working in a big team, you know, I used to, you know, I'm still running many teams, both in university and in companies. One of the major challenge I'm facing is that uh, every engineers have their own comfort zone and they may be using their own, you know, libraries of, uh, you know, machine learning uh, components, uh, different type of uh, AI ops or ML ops kind of uh, uh, supports. And the, when multiple engineers want to work in a team and talk to each other, it becomes really, a severe bottleneck. Okay, so go back to you know our production grade AI app, for example. How can we build uh, a uh, a uh, image report generator? You know, from a radiogram to a, a clinical case report. Say we have a AI agent that is uh, sitting on this problem. Then how to build it? Well, you need to first of all come up with uh, a very very uh, you know flexible and uh, extendable uh, no, uh, data enrichment platform to process all data. And you extract features, uh, you establish you know, uh, systems and uh, uh, paradigms to extract features, to uh, really uh, to uh, combine features, and also to allow even uh, training and uh, labeling you know, in different scenarios to take place. And then they are ready to go to next phase into the model and use an algorithm to train. And again, the model is a pipeline of many components. And then at the end of the day, you need to you know, load it onto, mount it onto a system, you know, uh, which uh, delivers you know, uh, efficient you know, training outcomes and maybe even to uh, you know, uh, adapt you know, into different uh, infrastructure environment, right? So this is a nightmare you know, very often time. You know, for an engineer, very, very complicated. And also the way it is done in most cases is a compromise uh, between all different constraints and it becomes uh, rather obscure when we want to go exam, you know, exactly what is happening inside the entire system, right? So 
What I meant to say is that there are severe effort needed at all levels of uh, machine learning operations. And uh, our practice, all, most of the time, you know, are producing unpredictable results because uh, it's a combination of a principled approach and also, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, carefully kept secrets of experiences and uh, sometimes uh, even company specific infrastructures and resources and so forth. So let's look at all these different levels where the efforts are needed. First of all, you need to build the model by either a, you know, a, you know, a ground up programming or composition. You need to form a pipeline of multiple model components. And then you need to, you know, uh, maybe tune them which is a business now known as AutoML, automatically, for example, you know, uh, uh, try different configurations to get the best training results. And then you need to also parallelize it if your model is too big and you need to schedule you know, different jobs if uh, you work as a team and different uh, teams, uh, different uh, engineers or uh, researchers are working on different problems on a single infrastructure. So all these actually practices leads to uncertainty and the risk in the final production. Right, so I'm, what I'm going to do today is to present a holistic and hopefully a unified you know, uh, uh, viewpoint and the uh, framework to uh, uh, cover all these uh, different needs at different level of AI production. I'm going to provide you know, uh, both a, uh, you know, a principled theoretic foundation and also actionable and uh, hopefully standardized and the generalizable work processes. So here are the three uh, topics I'm going to touch upon. I'm going to begin with uh, you know, presenting a theoretic framework you know, for you know, learning uh, under all experiences so that you don't have to you know, uh, come up with uh, you know, very specialized you know, uh, models and algorithms for a specific type of task or experience or data. And then I'm going to present a operation method which, which helps you the best effort of learning, you know, using again, you know, uh, you know, a principled approach. And finally, I'm going to uh, present a, uh, a compositional strategy, you know, for building production grade ML programs. So learning from the standard equation, you know, why this is interesting, because we don't want to be on the left of this graph where, you know, uh, we, you know, uh, you know, handle, you know, a, a myriad of uh, equations, and this is often time a bottleneck for engineers, you know, to really, uh, you know, uh, to walk through. Uh, instead, you know, we would like to, you know, uh, have a way, a mathematical framework to enable the inception and the creation of uh, a machine learning blueprint underlying, you know, the system, right? So how to achieve that? As I mentioned, there are so many algorithms and uh, heuristics out there, and it is very hard to understand all of them. But this is uh, not unique, in fact, in computer science. In many other disciplines in their early phase, you know, people face the same problem, such as in physics, for example. 200 years ago, the world of physics has dozens of theories for electricity and magnetism. In fact, they are viewed as a two different entity. Then there are many, many laws and, uh, and the equations you know, uh, you know, dedicated to that. And uh, here I have a short list. You, you see the, the Gauss law, the Ohm's law, the Ampere's law, Faraday's law, and so forth they are actually just a different perspective of the same thing, which is uh, electromagnetism, right? And then, you know, Maxwell, you know, presented his uh, equation, which uh, summarizes all these things into just uh, four equations using a matrix operator idea. And then this uh, whole exercise of uh, standardizing, you know, uh, physical laws, you know, moves on to the point that now we have a, a unification model uh, that is, uh, you know, relying on just one equation, you know, to describe already four of the five natural forces, you know, in natural world. Right? So this is kind of amazing. And it leads to a lot of uh, good, you know, practical outcome, such as, you know, uh, allowing, you know, electricity, allowing, you know, uh, information science to be, you know, uh, you know uh, summarized and uh, practiced in a highly simplistic way. Right? So in machine learning AI, Maybe it is also interesting to see whether such a standard model you know, can be formulated. And here is a proposal, right? So I wrote down an equation here, which contains three parts. The first part is called a experience function, which can be insensated to capture you know, data examples, rules, rewards, and so on. 
And the second part is called a divergence function. Uh, you know, it could be, you know, it's actually measuring the divergence between a teacher model and a student model, which allow them to get close to each other according to some measure. And then the very definition of divergence can be rather flexible. It could be cross entropy. It could be Jensen center divergence and other things. And then the last term is a, a uncertainty term, which governs, you know, uh, it's a self regulator to uh, kind of uh, penalize the amount of uncertainty you want to allow, you know, in the model. It turns out that you can plug in different uh, instantiations of these uh, three terms and recover many of the existing models and the uh, learning paradigms that we are very familiar with. For example, here is a tree that tells you that all these algorithms become the leaves of this uh, standard equation tree by you know, plug in these different uh, instantiations of the experiences, diverge, and so forth. So I'm going to just show you a few very familiar experiences. Right. For example, if you were to instantiate this experience function to be simply a delta function sitting on the data, you actually arrived at this formula, which is actually identical to the negative uh, lower bound, variation lower bound in maximum likelihood learning. Therefore, we recover a unsupervised MLE you know, by this instantiation. You can also you know, make the data instances more interesting by, you know, uh, by kind of uh, uh, introducing a, uh, a measure of uh, informativeness of every instances. And then you also can introduce an oracle that generates these instances. And then once you plug in the oracle into uh, the experience function, and also you know, add and, uh, and uh, combine them with uh, the inform informative term, suddenly you are at a learning algorithm which is identical to active learning. I can give you one more example here. Uh, if you were to uh, instantiate the experience function, you know, with uh, uh, the reward function, you know, formulated as uh, uh, the reward of a stage action pair. And then you plug in this back to the standard equation, you actually could recover reinforcement learning algorithm as inference, okay? You can also play with divergence function, you know, by replacing the original, you know, across entropy uh, with uh, a uh, jensen shannon divergence. And then you can also plug in experiences, you know, to be, you know, a adversal experiences, then suddenly you can re recover, you know, a, a number of uh, instances of uh, the generative adversary networks. Right. So I can go on and on with some more examples. So what's the catch? It's not that we have a formula that uh, looks beautiful by recovering, you know, all the, or many of the instances in machine learning algorithms. It actually gives you both, you know, a theoretical and also a practical appeal. On the theory side, Obviously, having one equation allows you to really, you know, look at uh, all the different learning algorithms in Unity and provides you a, a new paradigm for theoretical insights. But practically, because now we have uh, the experience function to be, you know, pluggable and instantiable with different type of instances, you can easily see that all different experiences can be combined through an additive sum. Therefore, you can now learn with all experiences one and all at a single time, and also to express, uh, explore complex interactions between experiences. And finally, this allows you a very clean mathematical foundation for compositionality of uh, multiple machine learning objectives, right? So here I show you a few examples. How to experience, uh, how to learn with uh, different exper experiences. So we use a technique known as uh, experience comp uh, composition. It's just like, you know, uh, formulating this experience function f as uh, a weighted sum of uh, multiple sub-experiences, such as data and a rule and rewards. Say you want to train a conversation system. Here, just a language model is not enough because it only guarantee you that, uh, you know, uh, there are kind of, uh, uh, you know, a semantic coherence, you know, in the language. But uh, what about uh, emotional correctness and uh, linguistic correctness? you actually could combine all these uh, three different experiences together, okay, and train a model that is uh, giving you not only emotionally interesting conversation, but also linguistically correct and syntactically correct. Maybe a more interesting example that is easy to visualize is to train, say, a, 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 you know, a, a video try-on system for fashion 
you know, applications, right? So here, you know, how to train, you know, uh, a virtual trial system is actually a very interesting problem because uh, you are going to be facing immediately a data scarcity issue. It is not very often to find enough examples for every gesture and every dress that uh, a store could encounter, right? But you also, you know, uh, have uh, information such as uh, human gesture constraints and other rules which already exist, you know, uh, in our daily knowledge. Therefore, you may not able, you may not need all these, uh, you know, uh, just illustration examples, right? So, in our application, you know, we described in this paper, we actually again combined multiple experiences so that uh, we can, you know, uh, train a, a virtual trial system using small, you know, uh, Im image data, and also plug in, you know, a lot of uh, other rules such as uh, human gestures. Right? You can see the effect. If uh, you just, you know, uh, have uh, you know, uh, you know, a base model, you know, a, a gun based model, it gives you images that is a uh, very, very obscure. If you add fixed knowledge, such as uh, this, uh, you know, fixed uh, uh, gesture kind of uh, uh, rules, you know, telling you where the body and uh, uh, where the, the heads, where the limbs and so forth, you get, uh, you know, uh, slightly better results because they at least want to observe all these, uh, you know, body posture rules. But if you allow the rules to be also learnable, you know, uh, you know, in a weighted way, you actually start to get closer to a more natural and effective image. So this is just a, a few examples about how can you benefit from learning from multiple experiences rather than single experiences. And also remember that we often create different uh, learning paradigms and algorithms, you know, for a particular type of experiences without letting all this uh, specific, you know, invention uh, to be, you know, applied elsewhere. But with the standard equation, you can see an easy way of reusing algorithms. For example, here I have a two learning paradigms. You know, posterior regularization is about learning the rules, and the intrinsic rewards is uh, in reinforcement learning to learn you know the value of the rewards. And there are algorithms in RL you know for learning that based on policy gradient, right? You can actually now you know uh, just uh, apply the same algorithm to a reparameterized kind of a rules which uh, you know, is learnable. And then you can use the same reinforcement learning algorithm to learn now the weights of uh, rules in the knowledge base. Likewise, you can apply the same technique to learn data augmentation, basically by introducing a weight function for every data instances. And suddenly these weights become learnable using a algorithm that originally was working in reinforcement learning. Right? Sometimes, you know, algorithm is created not to in the learning experience, but to generate uh, desirable learning effects. For example, people have been, you know, uh, developing a number of algorithms, again, in reinforced learning uh, for very stable learning outcome to avoid oscillation, to avoid kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, you, know uh, uh, you know, erratic steps, you know, in the gradient-based uh, optimization algorithm. So now in this uh, new uh, learning paradigm called GAN model, it is known that gun models are very difficult to train because uh, they suffer even more gravely, you know, the stability issue in algorithm. So one thing you can do is to just uh, plug in the gun model and also the reinforcement model all into the standard equation and start using what is uh, known in the reinforcement learning to be a stable algorithm, such as uh, you know, a proximal policy gradient you know, or you know, important sampling-based variational algorithm to learn the GAN models, which actually, again, can lead to greater stabilities. Right? So these are just examples of uh, the practical benefits that you can harvest you know, uh, from uh, the standard equation. There are a number of other advantages more on the theory side, as I mentioned already, analyzing the convergence and, uh, and uh, maybe the stability of the algorithm you know, uh, based on the standard model allows you to really kill multiple birds with one stone. Also, there is a possibility of uh, developing just one master algorithms to learn all different models, which I gave you kind of a, a illustration here, right? So we are going to be working on this equation. And this equation using, you know, a convex duality kind of a derivation, you can easily come up with uh, a iterative program, which are alternating between, you know, uh, you know, learning a teacher model that combines, you know, the current experiences you know, with uh, the current form of, uh, you know, uh, the student's knowledge. And then in the 
M step, which equivalents to you know a student phase, we can actually you know minimize the divergence between the teacher model and the student model. And this iteration, you know, uh, is uh, you know uh, reflected in many of the known algorithms, such as a variational EM, a alternating gradient descent, and so forth. And you can again bring in many of the known tricks, such as a kernel trick for nonlinear you know, feature combination, such as a probabilistic functional descent for more general design you know, of uh, you know, uh, the, uh, the importance function family to really you know, get a turnkey algorithm for learning all different type of uh, experiences and models. So for the interest of time, I'm going to skip some of the technical details underlying what I just argued in terms of uh, designing you know, a powerful and a flexible turnkey algorithm and then move on to the second part, which is uh, uh, very important. Actually, I'm going to skip this part as well, which is uh, you know, using, the version, uh, using the standard equation to generate a, a more global and universal theoretical insight, such as uh, adversarial robustness and so forth, which was not only developed for a small subset of models that is uh, more handy for the theoretical analysis. So I'm going to now switch gear to talk a little bit about uh, learning to learn, because uh, it turns out that once we have a very good model that works on uh, a benchmark data set, or you know takes uh, you know a a a a good kind of outcome you know uh, on a leaderboard, once you want to dis de deploy it and integrate with other kind of uh, uh, environment or maybe try on a different data, very often time you need to retune the data or the model. Uh, and uh, that's a, 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 a practice often known as uh, you know, a meta learning or you know, uh, auto ML and so forth. So this is about learning to learn. And this is a space where, uh, again, there are a lot of uh, different uh, opportunities. For example, you can learn to learn the best configuration of the hyperparameters you can learn to learn the best uh, architectures of a neural architecture. You can even learn what's the best configuration of a parallelization strategy so that you can distribute your larger model to a system better, right? So right now, most of this uh, work is uh, relying very heavily you know, on uh, either a manual effort or a very uh, uh, low payoff and, uh, and uh, uh, less kind of universal uh, special tricks that applies to only uh, a few models, such as uh, learning the weights of a, the hyperparameters of a random forest tree and uh, some other specialized models. So what I'm going to present in the next few minutes is to uh, give you uh, uh, the you know a alternative uh, uh, generic approach, which is known as uh, model-based optimization based on black ba uh, black box functions. Okay, and I'm going to show you how this technique can be applied to HPO, NAS, or even automatic distribution of uh, machine learning. And also the goal you know, uh, for searching for the optimal configuration can also be extended from a intrinsic war reward, such as the loss function, to any function, such as uh, extrinsic values, like cost effectiveness, energy efficiencies, and so forth. So the idea is to you know, come up with a uh, formalism uh, that is uh, principled and automatable so that you can actually deploy an algorithm, you know, on top of its own work to drive the learning automatically. So one of the challenges in this uh, uh, application is that uh, very often time, we are literally facing uh, a black box as an object. You don't actually know uh, the exact you know, uh, analytic form of the target so that you can take a gradient, or you can basically, you know, uh, uh, do analytics, you know, and uh, do very, very, uh, you know, specific mathematical optimization. Here, maybe the least you can assume, maybe only the most you can assume is that you can do experiment with a system. You can do a try, and then see the outcome and try again. And the goal is to try as little as possible and still get the best outcome. So this is known as a black box optimization. So let me set down, uh, set the stage a little bit more formally. So here we we'll face a search space, which could be 
the range of uh, hyperparameters, the architectures of uh, neural networks, or the partition and placement of uh, a uh, larger model into a cluster, right? And uh, the query is just to run the experiments, train it once, which is obviously is very expensive. You train it once, which will cost you a few days, if not a few hours. And uh, then the objective is to uh, get the best training configuration, either in terms of uh, the model quality or your cost for the training, right? And uh, uh, these days people have tried a number of methods. One obviously is the grid search. You just uh, divide you know, the, the search space into a grid and uh, systematically you know, uh, re, you know, uh, you know, um, you know, try all these different uh, points. You can do a random try. You can do, you know, uh, you know, a, a great uh, kind of search. Uh, you can also maybe do a genetic algorithm, you know, to uh, search, you know, more greedily. What we're going to talk about is a Bayesian optimization approach, which uh, you know, uh, learns a model, okay, of uh, the trial and also the behavior of the black box, so that you can make less trial to get the best outcome. So here's a setup. It's called a Bayesian optimization. The main idea is to use uh, uh, two sets of equations. One is known as the, the probabilistic acquisition model, which can help you to intelligently plan you know, uh, the experiments okay, to perform efficient optimization. And uh, the way I achieve so is to map every configuration or every trial you know, that you're going to, to use you know, uh, to over its uh, uncertainty of the objective so that uh, you can actually you know, use it to select the next trial and also assess the risk. But on the other hand, this equation is not enough because you don't actually yet know the value, okay, other than uncertainty of that trial yet. So that part of the task is covered by what is known as the acquisition function, okay, which, uh, you know, uh, predicts, you know, the, the, the objective, you know, to give you a sense of the value. And once you have the acquisition function, you can use uh, a optimizer to determine the next trial, and then you can use that outcome to update your probabilistic acquisition model, right? So the algorithms goes like this. It's a doubly nested loop. On the outer loop, you know, you, uh, you, know, uh, you learn the probabilistic acquisition model. And then in the inner loop, you optimize the acquisition function and you, you know, execute the acquisition function to make the next try. And then you get one more data points, you update the probabilistic acquisition model. So let's walk in and see how it actually behaves. We can take a, a, a few steps and a, ver a, a few virtual steps to see you know, how we you know, can gradually move into a better convergence. Say we have a, a prior distribution of uh, the function of a trial and the return mapping. You know, this is a prior distribution of the function. Therefore, you need to you know, uh, you know, uh, use a technique known uh, in the non-parametric Bayesian function to model function uncertainty. So in this case, we're using Gaussian process. And then you begin with uh, already a few previous trial, which uh, gives you a few pairs of X and Ys, right? And that allows you to already, you know, uh, uh, derive a posterior of the Gaussian process, which gives you, you know, a distribution over the best possible functions, right? And then using that, you can compute in acquisition function like this, you can see that the acquisition function has a higher value where the uncertainty is big and has a lower value where you already see the data, right? But on the other hand, it also reflects you the global you know, uh, utility of that trial you know, in the space of uh, possible experiments. And accordingly, you pick your best points and then you make an experiment, you observed a reward, you are going to now update the equation, uh, the probably equation model. As you can see, you know, the key thing that is going to impact the results is uh, the definition of the acquisition function itself, right? And uh, that actually can be also learned in various interesting ways. And here I'm just proposing one way. For example, you have uh, now, you know, a posterior distribution of uh, the, uh, the model and uh, each of you will give you uh, the best prediction, you know, of uh, uh, the trial X and also the return Y. Right. So these multiple predictions by themselves defines a posterior distribution of the acquisition, right? 
And uh, you can actually now, you know, uh, define the equation function to be such that if I use this posterior to determine the next best experiment, I'm going to reduce, for example, at best, my level of uncertainty over the behavior of this experiment. So this is known as the expected information game, which is the difference between a entropy you know, over the current set of experiments versus the entropy, suppose you are giving one more data points of the experiments. Right. Again, these are just examples of uh, candidate acquisition functions. There are many others, but let me jump to you know, uh, a quick show of the results, right? So the results actually is a uh, pretty uh, universal and uh, generalizable across different type of models, such as uh, we see here, grading boost regressions, you know, uh, deep learning models, random forests and so forth. And also the number of parameters range from, uh, you know, a few parameters like six to many parameters, like more than a hundred. And in almost all the cases, this uh, black box Basing of machine algorithm is able to get you down to a good configuration in a you know a smaller number of uh, trials than many of the competing algorithms. And again, this MBO is not limited to hyperparameter optimization. You can use it for NAS, you know. And the only thing you need to do is that because we are using a Gaussian process to model basically the posterior. Therefore, all you need to know is the pairwise distances between different configurations. Therefore, you can use a optimal transport to basically define the distances between different neural architectures. And then you can effectively do the search in the architecture space. You can also use a more um, you know, rich uh, function you know, instead of a Gaussian process to define the probabilistic acquisition model. So at the end of the day, you are going to you know, uh, have a uh, very, very large family that can be covered in the neural architecture space for immediate search. You can also apply the MBO to system search. As I just mentioned, you know, uh, when you are working on scheduling of multiple tasks, you, know, you may want to you know, uh, balance you know, the appeal of uh, uh, both you know, uh, statistical efficiency and also throughput, the data efficiency. Because uh, at the end of the day, you want to be not just fast, but also train good models. And uh, in this case, in a paper we published last year at OSDI, we introduced a new loss function for the system called the good put, which is a combination of the throughput and the efficiency. And the, the tuning knobs in this situation is the batch size of your training, the learning rate of your training, and a few other you know, system parameters. And again, you can use MBO to you know, uh, you know, do you know, an optimal search using experimentations. Right. So the space of learning to learn is actually quite big. What I just did was just scratch the surface of some very immediate task, but there are some new opportunities already opened up. For example, you know, here, you know, we want to, you know, we, we probably recognize already that you know, we're not going to do meta learning or HPO just once. Every time we receive a new, uh, you know, uh, task, you know, we're slightly changing data sets on, to train and maybe a slightly augmented the model, we're going to redo the HPO. And are these different experiments, you know, completely independent and not salvageable, or they can be amortized, right? So the amortized auto-tuning is about classifying your historic training tasks and then find patterns. And in the future, when you have a new task of uh, hyperparameter tuning to come, you can actually do a regression and find out which task in your database is closer to your new task, and then use that as a, a proposal uh, of, for example, the probabilistic acquisition model to even speed up you know, your, your experimentation. It can reduce, for example, your dozens of trials down to maybe just a few trials, maybe down to even five or less. Right? So that's actually a very interesting topic that we've been working on. Secondly, there is this uh, huge space now in SysML, you know, study how to learn automatically parallelize a model. Again, this is a problem uh, not necessarily, you know, uh, attracting too many uh, algorithmic and theoretical machine learning uh, researcher yet, but it's very important because uh, once you have a complex and a large enough model, you have to basically, you know, utilize your clusters to train them in a distributed fashion. And building a distributed strategy involves 
finding the best partition, the best placement, how to synchronize across machines, and how to schedule different jobs. This strategy is actually quite non-trivial to optimize, right? It requires substantial domain knowledge. And uh, again, you know, there is opportunity here to formalize it using machine learning knowledge. For example, at a fine grain level, we want to recognize that all the parallel machine learning strategies, you know, uh, takes, you know, uh, as a, uh, you know, a, a operator representation of machine learning program rather than, you know, a symbolic representation. So here the operators, you know, correspond to, you know, a typical, you know, matrix or tensor, you know, oriented uh, mathematical operations such as addition, multiplications and all that. And then you can use that as uh, the substrate to come up with uh, different parallelization schemes. For example, a particular type of uh, parallelization scheme is known as the intraoperator, you know, parallelization, right? It means that uh, you want to divide the operator, you know, uh, in different ways. For example, here I'm dividing along the row dimension, which effectively cuts data into subsets. This is known as data parallelism. Or you can, you know, cut or divide, you know, the, the parameters, you know, based on your device constraints. And this is known as the model parallelism. And you can do them in a mixed fashion as well, right? Sometimes you do nothing, but you, you can replicate the operators to reduce communication with the cost of increasing the data volume, right? Another type of a parallelism is known as uh, inter-operator mechanism because uh, many of the models that we're working on, such as deep learning models, are multiple stages. You can actually just, uh, you, know, uh, you know, place different stage of uh, the operator onto different devices, and then try to see whether they can, you know, uh, overlay on top of each other to create pipeline parallelisms. Right. So these two type of parallelisms actually do have a very, very important and uh, intricate uh, communication cost uh, implications. For example, for intra-parallel, uh, intra-op parallelism, you know, you need to have a large bandwidth of uh, communicating between different uh, operations. But uh, between, you know, different, uh, you know, uh, stages and the modules, you actually don't have to, you know, carry out a very high bandwidth communication, right? So this provides you a hierarchical way of uh, designing the parallelization strategy. We can begin with uh, a inter-parallel, uh, inter-op parallelization by finding the best way of uh, staging different uh, phase of the model and place them on different devices. And then within every stage, you can look into the operator and determine whether you want to have a model or data parallelism or mixed parallelism, right? Again, so these type of uh, practices are known to the system engineers and some of the system people, but it is in practice very, very difficult to realize. First of all, mathematically, you need to find the good way to uh, you know, uh, map this uh, representation of a parallelism to the actual device architecture and topology. And uh, there are some basic principles such as uh, mapping you know, the heavy communication uh, computational uh, work into a uh, course within a GPU machine and the divide you know, the inter-op parallelism across multiple workstations and so forth. But uh, in terms of uh, the detailed optimization, it requires uh, a very intricate you know, and also quantifiable way of uh, seeking the optimal mapping between the task representation and also the device representation. And that's actually a mathematical program problem, right? So uh, recently, uh, my colleagues you know, worked on, uh, published a paper at OSDI known as uh, the OPA algorithm or system, which actually provides you a, a system for automatically parallelize, you know, the optimum sysML mapping, right? Again, the idea is uh, very straightforward. It begins by identifying the best, you know, uh, creating a pipeline of stages, okay? And then, you know, try to, and also divide the computing infrastructure into, you know, mesh and blocks. And then first do the automatic mapping between the stage and the mesh, and then you know going within the mesh and map you know the interop uh, you know parallelism into the detailed uh, communication and the memory and the and the computing placement inside the mesh. Right? 
So how to achieve that? Well, it was achieved by mathematical programming, as I mentioned, right? So in the inter-op pass, you are going to now find the optimum pairs you know, of a stage and the mesh that uh, leads to the minimum amount of a communication cost, which can be achieved by a dynamic programming procedure. And uh, in the intra-op pass, you, know, you want to now start uh, quantifying the nodal cost of uh, you know, every you know, uh, partition inside the operator uh, when you know, uh, carrying out its computation and also the edge cost, which is uh, the communication and the delay incurred because of uh, the, commu the, the, commu the, the, the interaction and exchange of messages between different parts. Again, this can be done using an integer programming prop, uh, in a procedure. So at the end of the day, you know, by solving both representation uh, of uh, resource and the computing task and the solving the optimum mapping between the two, we can actually you know, achieve you know, almost optimum automatic parallelization on a variety of different models. And here I can show you a few examples. People are talking about training GPT-3 you know, on highly you know, uh, uh, specialized you know, architecture such as the, the Megatron, right? And uh, using you know, the OPA, we were able to you know, automatically generate a parallelization procedure and strategy that is uh, as good as uh, the specialized Megatron platform. But remember, Megatron is only built you know, for GPT-3. You cannot really run it for other models so optimally. Right? So here we have a generic platform that is doing well, even with the best of the breed for this particular model. Moving on to other models, such as a mixture of expert model, we achieve you know, an order of magnitude improvement you know, over even a manually designed baseline. And there are some models, such as the the, rest, the, the, the W ResNet, which is uh, very complex in terms of its heterogeneous structure, so that uh, there are no very optimum distributed machine learning design infrastructure for it. And again, we can still you know, uh, come up with a automatically generated distributed strategy to achieve very good results. So with that, uh, let me uh, wrap up a little bit. So we've seen already you know, uh, a standardized and the uh, principled way of uh, building models. And we've seen also a uh, principled and elegant way of uh, you know, tuning and uh, uh, these models or learn how to learn these models. And at the end of the day, we still need to put them together. That actually leads us to you know, a pipeline from models because a model is only going to be you know, able to address you know, a small part of uh, the entire needs for a whole machine solutions. And here I show you an instance of the pipeline. And you will see very soon, it is reflected in almost all the practical machine learning productions that we are facing. And in these pipelines, there are many components, many steps, and many objectives and the configurations. There are more knobs to tune than we've just seen so far, right? So how can we actually apply the technique I just mentioned to a pipeline level optimization? So that leads to my last part of the talk, which actually also features and uh, significates uh, the need of a Lego learning. So here is uh, a AI product, as you are all familiar with, right? a conversation system. And a conversation system has uh, many parts, including query processing, retrieval, ranking, and uh, language and, and the answer generation, refinements, and so forth. Right? And uh, it requires a representation as a computing graph to even uh, get uh, deployed it and uh, assembled. So here is uh, just an example of such a pipeline, which exposes the heterogeneity of all the building blocks. And uh, how to train it? First of all, training this is no longer a single step. You need to have uh, multiple steps working in all these pipelines. Each of them may have its own you know, deep learning or machine learning models. And then based on what objective you train, again, the objective can be very heterogeneous. Uh, many people care about uh, the final quality of the output, which happens at the end of the pipeline. But uh, you may also worry about the latency, you know, how soon I can get this uh, uh, optimum response out of this uh, whole pipeline. Right? You may also worry about uh, the model size and, uh, and the architectural needs 
in each of the components, right? So all this actually becomes uh, a objective of interest when you build a pipeline rather than a single model, right? And then the, the knobs that you can tune, you know, to optimize this is also very, very heterogeneous. For example, you can make choices between different tokenizers, taggers, and uh, other alternatives of uh, the, the, the building blocks. You can, you know, uh, choose uh, different uh, algorithms, you know, for search and for other training. You can also, of course, play with hyperparameters to uh, make the training behaving better, converging faster, and so forth, right? So, and we can actually uh, maybe fiddle with uh, different type of uh, data and the uh, history and the version to improve the results, right? Again, there are many, many knobs to tune. And uh, to work on this and also to parallelize this into a larger infrastructure, again, becomes uh, a very, very challenging task. In fact, uh, that's the bottleneck of uh, the team that I work with. Right, it sometimes happened on a particular magic master engineer lead who somehow knows how to stitch all these components together and to synthesize and integrate all different programs. But these kind of uh, master engineers are uh, not very easy to train and uh, recruit. And also there is a bottleneck and also a risk. What if uh, uh, she decides to quit or to move on to another work, right? So what we want to achieve at the last part of the talk is to really try rethink about the production process, how to build it more reliably and optimally. Instead of uh, handling a black box due to a very, very hectic and uh, undisciplined practice you know, in our engineering daily routine, can we open the black box and start to find you know, standardized you know, uh, principles you know, in it, for example, defining standard parts such as nuts and bolts. You know, here we call them Legos, which amounts to models and tools that we can, you know, we have already talked about. And also, can we use a standardized architecture and workflow to describe the pipeline? And also, you know, more formal representations so that they can be universally, you know, adopted, you know, to uh, have, a, you know, more general usability. And finally, can we actually come up with a more composable and a certifiable strategy you know, and a process to realize and to assemble and also to allow mapping between different phases of the work happening in a predictive and a deterministic way, right? So this is uh, the kind of desirable outcome we want to achieve. You know, it's not about just a typical uh, leaderboard uh, benchmark performance on scores. Here we are you know, focusing on reusability, you know, automatability, and optimizability you know, in all dimensions. So this is closer to what people do in mature industrial production, where, for example, creating an aircraft. You know, typically in there, there are this uh, you know, fault or error diagram, which helps you to track the propagation of error and also help you to simulate all different outcomes. So we are hoping to have a, you know, a production process of this kind to make them more as I said, certifiable and reliable, right? So Legos, we have enough. I talk about at length about machinery Legos, thanks to the formulation of the standard equation, which uh, exposes all different, uh, you know, instantiations of experiences, of algorithms, of uh, different choices of models and divergence functions and so forth. We also have uh, a pretty mature and rich library of uh, system Legos, which worries about uh, different choices of uh, computing procedures, different ways of uh, managing the manage management uh, memories, different ways of uh, performing communications and so forth. So again, these are you know, standard you know, and uh, growing knowledges that is uh, you know, uh, present in the literature. And then there are also you know, many nowadays ML op logos, uh, Legos, you know, worry about uh, you know, uh, life cycles of the product at different phases experiences, models, and pipelines. And then there are also tools to manage experimentations and the serving and so forth. So these Legos you know, is becoming more and more available. The problem is that how can we you know, let them to, how can we orchestrate them? How can we actually let them to play interactively? Right? So we began by introducing you know, a more standardized representation at the level of uh, experiences so that all data can be described using you know, a universal template, which we call the data pack. 
which is actually a ontology, which is elastic, can be extended or shrinked to fit particular needs of a particular type of data. And then the model wrap is premature. You know, we have a data flow graph. In fact, there are also the vertex program focused, uh, you know, dynamic graph representation of uh, deep learning workflow, which I'm not going to skip, uh, talk about for the sake of time. And uh, the, the pipeline also can be represented in a graphical format to represent the interconnectivity and the traffic and also, you know, the messages floating between different components. And lastly, we can, you know, represent the ML, you know, uh, op, uh, you know, uh, building blocks, which are the software components, you know, and also the stores of uh, intermediate forms and the versions into a standard form. So these type of uh, representations at different level provides you the substrate of uh, generating optimal mapping and alignment across different stages. Like I showing here, for example, you can map different uh, stage and different uh, parts of uh, the you know, model of every single model and all different models into the corresponding you know, components in hardware. You can also start placing different stages in a pipeline to different you know, configurations of the hardware. And then the ML op you know, building blocks can also be mapped toward different parts of the hardware. So here I'm emphasizing the needs and also the possibility of uh, having a principled composition and orchestration of uh, the workflow at different stages. And there are tools, you know, uh, at least already available, you know, you know, we developed in the past few years for, you know, uh, detailed optimization in every different phases, such as model composition, such as, uh, you know, uh, model-based tuning, and also, you know, uh, automatic parallelization and distribution, as I mentioned before. And it is actually not hard to, uh, well, it is hard, but it is doable to extend this type of uh, tools into pipeline level or whole kind of uh, solution level optimization. For example, we are in the process of uh, extending the auto-tune uh, algorithms I just mentioned into the pipeline using either you know, a zeroth order approach as we saw earlier in Bayesian optimization or even a first order approach by you know, playing with uh, systematically you know, the propagation of gradients across different pipelines. There is also a work undergoing developing a compiler type of technology to really you know, uh, come up with a, a uh, executable that is uh, allowing you know, uh, machine learning code and also machine pipeline to be automatically distributed on a cluster by solving a automation problem that maximize you know, the desired output as a function of a data and a resource and the configuration strategies. So just to put it together, here is uh, what we could see as uh, how to solve a uh, solution level AI problem, not a algorithmic level or model level. Right? So you started you know, uh, using a particular tool, you know, which is available from uh, you know a variety of communities in the open source domain, including in our own company that provides you the composition of the model, and then you can use uh, a tool we call Forte to compose a ML pipeline. The ML pipeline is composed in such a way that mm -hmm. they expose themselves to a uh, public intermediate representation, which uh, can universally talk to each other and interact with uh, the machine learning workflow you know, uh, managers of different uh, you know, phases. And then you can run optimization algorithms, auto-tuning algorithms, auto-parallel algorithms accordingly in this workflow level. So here is a graphical interface showing you, you know, how this system might be working. Uh, we call this system a Rampart platform, which provides you both infrastructure and the app orchestration using drag and play and also you know, a coding console, if you like, and also a compositional canvas that allows, again, free of code, GUI-based you know, machine learning model composition or you know, a, you know, interaction between machine and the human experts for interactive coding. So I'm going to wrap up. So the high-level message I want to uh, converge at is that even though machine learning operation and the workflow is a very complex universe that deals with uh, 
multiple levels of uh, challenges in training, in tuning, in parallelization, scheduling, and pipelining. At least uh, based on our current understanding, each of the stage can be you know, mathematicalized and can be captured in a principled way so that their outcomes is predictable and modelable. And then with the tools built on top of this, there is a possibility and there may be even a need to you know, allow optimization of a machine learning solution at all level. You know, the performance improvement can be defined as a function of uh, the experience configuration, the model configuration, pipeline configuration, and system configuration. And the space optimization could be, again, at all level, starting from architecture, hyperparameters, distribution partition, synchronization, and schedule, and so forth. So here, with this uh, very, very general and universal framework, I believe it provides a pathway for the machine learning and AI system to be built you know, based on uh, not just maximizing system performance, you know, or intrinsic, you know, uh, model performance such as uh, loss functions and uh, maybe, you know, benchmark accuracy and so forth. It could also allow you to introduce uh, user performances in the form of, uh, for example, good put, which combines statistical efficiency and data efficiency, and also assisting efficiency and maximize even utilization of the data and the resource, and also maximize the speed of convergence and so forth, right? So the way to achieve that again, as I return to our starting point, is not to, you know, uh, through uh, a very ad hoc, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, ad hoc practice, you know, of, uh, you know, system engineering and plumbing. Hopefully we're going to be using a very standardized set of uh, tools, representations and the principles you know, and also mathematical optimization procedures to achieve, you know, optimal machine learning at all level. So with that, I want to close my talk. And uh, this is a page where all the tools I just uh, uh, introduced, you know, can be found, you know, uh, through this uh, website. And uh, uh, it is uh, a open source ecosystem that is not only providing you our own development, but also you know, accommodating and inviting, you know, distributors and developers uh, from our larger community to contribute your own work into it. And uh, recently, you know, we've got some good recognitions, you know, from our work, such as uh, a best paper at OSDI, a best paper at ACL, and uh, more to come in the next few months. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Eric. That was uh, very interesting and very useful. And uh, I look forward to checking out some of those tools that you recommended. Um, we're a little bit over time, so I think we're going to leave it there. But thank you again so much for presenting. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you.